One of the things I think we learned in 2020 and 2021 is growth can't be bought and not all growth is the same. And so I think when you're playing a growth at all costs mindset, you really rely on so many things out of your control. On this week's episode of Tank Talks, we welcome John Richtegar, Director of Capital at RBCX, to dive into a fresh perspective on the Canadian venture capital ecosystem. John shares what inspired him to spend over a year researching the industry, which culminated in his team's recently launched report entitled Spotlight, Capital Exited in Canadian Venture over the past decade, and the insights his team uncovered in their analysis. We'll explore key insights from John's research, including the implications of a record-breaking exit market in 2020 and 2021, and why the top 50 exits make up 85% of Canada's aggregate exit value. This episode is packed with actionable advice for GPs, LPs, and founders navigating the ever-evolving Canadian venture landscape. But before we jump into this week's interview, we welcome back to the tank John Ruffalo to discuss the news and stories making headlines in the tech and venture capital ecosystem. Welcome back to the tank, John. Busy week, obviously a lot going on in the U.S. How you been? Great, man. How are you? I'm good. Is your head spinning trying to keep up with all the different nominees in the U.S. government? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, i know i think what is it it's ten thousand appointments or something insane uh, like that that's it's in, pretty I, fast that's, uh, i don't think we've ever moved that fast in our entire com- uh, country existence in canada but we'll get to that in a sec i want to kick things off with what you posted about and what we saw out of the q3 canadian venture capital uh private equity association the cvca's report out of the q3 2024 report kind of giving a bit of a mixed signal around the venture capital landscape obviously you know we Want to give some high-level numbers, and then we'll get into the weeds here. But basically, venture capital investment reached $2.65 billion Canadian, which was a 6% increase quarter over quarter and a 51% increase year over year. But that number is heavily skewed by two significant deals that you obviously mentioned as well in your LinkedIn post. One being the Clio $1.24 billion Canadian Series F round, and obviously Cohere $616 million Canadian funding round as well. If you exclude those two deals, the remaining 128 deals total 795 million Canadian, matching the low levels seen during COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. So I'll give more data points on that, but you have a, a thought on why this is occurring and what's happening. Well, you know, and again, I'm not trying to sound the alarm bells or point the finger of I told you so, but maybe I'll point half the finger now and 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 allow the next quarter or two to see as we were worried and as when the government imposed this increase on capital gains tax, it could not be at a worse time. And what you need to do is you need to dissect the data and it's telling you a couple of things. The domestic capital in Canada is dropping like a stone, number one. So on the Clio deal, that's a one US investor check. Cohere, you know, we had PSP and a few other folks. There's a mix in there, but you go to Wabi, it's virtually all US. When you actually, and I listed the top 10 deals, almost all virtually US and other players in there. So when you A, look at Canadian domestic capital, which is what the concern was, but the real signal is look at the early stage investing because that's the, the lifeblood because there is no late stage investing unless you have the early stage, that is dropping like a stone and the number of deals that are closing is dropped. And those very early stage deals, it's generally done with domestic capital. And again, too early to dictate whether this is a trend. But for the naysayers who said taxes don't matter, hold your horses. This certainly didn't help. And it's probably at the absolute wrong time. So I'm getting worried. I'm not having a heart attack just yet. Give me another quarter or two. And I think the the impact of these decisions will show up. Yeah, it's interesting though, because you're saying on one hand that early stage investors like angel investors and high net worth individuals who typically write checks either into early stage funds like ours or into early stage startups are pulling back because of the after-tax consequences, right? The capital gains exceeding it's 250 It's one K. of the factors. That's one yes, of the reasons, It doesn't right. but, help. It doesn't help, yes. But what did, wouldn't that necessarily also argue, I guess, on why even U.S. investors would not want to be putting capital into Canada? Like, why are the later stage rounds even getting capital? Are the deals just too good? 
Are these investors uh, tax exempt? That doesn't necessarily jive. Like why put any money into Canada, whether it's early stage or late stage then? The taxation of the gain, if you are a non-Canadian resident, uh, you're not paying any Canadian tax, so you're indifferent on what happens from a capital gains perspective. Now, if the Democrats got in and they massively jacked up the capital gains taxes, you would see a similar muted investment because it's 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 taxed globally. But then wouldn't you see more U.S. Inv- early stage U.S. investors wanting to put money into Canada then with the, the, the lack of Canadian domestic capital, you know, taken out of the market? You would think so, right? Yeah, but the, the the thing is, though, is that venture investing is a very localized game, number one, right? So the reason why you need a very strong domestic source of capital is particularly at the early stages, number one. Number two, if you go and look at the U.S. stats as well, they're also down. So what's happening is that you're getting this muted effect uh, in North America, but in Canada, it never went to a, an extreme high just because of the lack of our capital. And I, you know, and the real point is if the angels or the high net worth are, are not putting in the money in the early stage ecosystem, where exactly are you going to get it from in Canada? I'll totally agree with you on that, John. I'm saying from our side of things, we have never been busier investing at the early stage, but when, we're only a handful of funds that are able to invest at the really earliest stages. So there really aren't a lot of options out there. Number one, well, and num- that's why you're seeing it. It's yeah. so you're actually reinforcing the point. What you're just saying is there's not a whole lot of competition for capital. No, there is not. And I'll tell you the other thing on the on the LP conversations or the institutional investors down south that we're speaking to right now. They're saying, you know what, Canada's not even really a part of the conversation. Number one, I the know. policies up there are not that great. Number two. The outcomes of what we have going on in the U.S. are much bigger. And number three, our economy is just doing so much better. So there's no need to step out of the U.S. The U.S. economy is doing so good. And now with Trump coming in as president-elect, you have more. It's, you have more things to look forward to. So I totally think that there is a reason why we're seeing these numbers. And this is from Q3. Wait till you see what probably Q4 and Q1 looks like. Yeah. And by the way, my comments as an investor we're having the busiest quarter in our history right now. It is, as an investor, it's because of the lack of competition for capital in Canada. It is good for us. I would say to you, this is not necessarily good for Canada. That was really my point. Absolutely. Switching gears to sort of the pre-IPO and uh, post-IPO conversation, we've got two stories in the news this last week. One is the Klarna highly anticipated IPO filing has finally dropped. Now, this company is making a move to go public, maybe suggesting that the market conditions are more favorable for fintechs, obviously seeing some of the public names doing quite well, like Affirm and some of its other competitors. But Clarinus had a very long history of teetering with the idea of going public. And apparently the company has been rebounding on and improving its financials. Just to give our listeners some highlights, you know, from 2020 to 2021, Klarna experienced, obviously, rapid growth during the pandemic, with its GMV increasing from $53 billion in 2020 to over $80 billion in 2021, and revenue grew accordingly, but obviously their losses widened significantly as they tried to you know, push that growth to the limit, with uh, losses of $828 million, almost a billion in 2021. During you know, the tail end of the pandemic, growth obviously slowed, uh, and the company's valuation dropped, actually, significantly, from a height of $46 billion to under $7 billion obviously given the huge losses and the decline in the Swedish value of its currency. And now in 2023, first half of 24, their company has rebounded, improving its financials and narrowing its losses, hoping to achieve some form of operating profit in the first half of 2024. And now obviously hoping to go public as more of their competitors, like I said, Affirm and PayPal and Sizzle are seeing significant share price increases, especially in the last few weeks. So do you think is this is the first of many or this is a very unique situation given where the competitors are? Yeah, I think this is a unique situation and one that I do hope bodes well for the market. What was unusual is when their business uh, uh, took a very bad turn uh, and it was really, I guess, led by Sequoia. Instead of trying to obfuscate the value and trying to structure a deal, what surprised me is the massive valuation haircut that they took. That is not normal. 
again, I don't know what's, I, I only know what I read, but it just felt like a very honest assessment of where your business was in. And there was a bunch of adults around the table, including the, uh, you know, the CEOs and the management team of Klarna that said, you know what, this business will take a massive haircut. They did all of the things that they needed to do to right size the business. The business is now, it's very tough that once you have revenue dropping and then to restart it back up and they did do it. And now they're coming out in the market when there are stronger, bigger, faster. And I, I wish them all the best because it's actually just proving when times like this happen, don't try to bury your head in the sand and just hope for the best. They took it by the horns and they controlled the entire direction. So I am actually rooting for them to hopefully have a big win on this. And this will be a nice poster child for the rest of the companies that have had, you know, uh, challenges in their business. Yeah, it definitely feels like a bit of an Instacart situation, right? Cleaning up the the prep stack, combining everyone into common shares, and just letting them build in public after going through those wild swings. But it also shows that you can do a down round and still forge on. Survive. Um, you know, and survive. And that's what some founders maybe have to realize is like a down round is not necessarily the end of your journey. It's just a reset. And then you have a whole other lifetime to continue to build it. But switching on to the companies that are not yet ready to go public, but having to deal with some liquidity issues is Databricks. I'm not sure if you saw this. Databricks, last value at $43 billion last year, is considering raising several billion dollars to allow employees to cash out stock rent. Obviously, there are RSUs that are set to expire in 20, early 26. And this move is obviously not because they can't go public, but I think they want to delay going public while also keeping some of their top employees engaged. Right now, the conversations are happening around a $55 billion valuation, you know, where its rival Snowflake is currently valued around $40 billion or so. And there's a lot of this pressure of these like later stage pre-IPO companies to either go public or provide some liquidity options for their employees. You talked about this last time on the open AI situation. You know, what are your thoughts on how this decision to raise funds, but going towards the secondary versus going the IPO route is going to impact employees and investors' uh, willingness to continue to support them? And what are the kind of advantages or disadvantages of delaying its IPO in favor of these kind of private secondary deals? Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of these sorts of transactions. Uh, and, and for the listeners, there is a difference in the Canadian and U.S. system on where the, when the taxation event occurs. So what ends up happening in the United States, you do end up with a lot of situations where there's tax liabilities triggered, but there's no liquidity of the stock. Uh, in Canada, our rules are actually far more favorable from, from that perspective. So I get that the challenge I, I am assuming there is they don't want the employees to leave, of course, and they have talented employees. So Yes, that's good, but I would comment back it is a function of the fact that they're delaying going public in the first place. When you go public, when you probably should be going public to deal with these sort of issues, the market naturally takes care of this illiquidity tax mismatch. So I think that they are uh, incurring these issues only because of this delay and this never-ending delay of always trying to seek private capital. You know, I do wonder whether that's going to change, but in the near term, I don't see it changing very much because there's still so much dry powder sitting in private company hands. And there is this big reluctance for folks to go public because of the compliance costs, the disclosures, and all the BS that goes with it. It's, it's kind of a reflection of that is the issue. Yeah, if you sucked out all of that later stage, so like massive pre-IPO funding, I think they would have to take the medicine and go public and just deal with the consequences of whatever may come from going public. But it's, again, not the end of the road for these companies. Obviously, easier for us to say this sitting here, but I understand why there's this reluctancy to do it when you've got you know Thrive willing to throw a billion dollars at you to, to get rid of one headache and move on to the next one later on or kick the can down the road.
I understand why the management team is doing it. It's, it solves their headache. I, I, I get it. Yeah, exactly. Well, speaking of uh, headaches that hopefully will be going away, feels like Elizabeth Warren's got a pretty big headache coming down her pipe, talking about how the need for a uh, Office of Government Efficiency, known as the Department of Government Efficiency, Doge, is taking effect. And obviously, everyone's seen the news that Elon and Vivek Ramaswamy is going to lead the new Department of Government Efficiency. Uh, she's saying how you need two people to do the work of one person doesn't seem really efficient. Elon comes over the top rope and says, actually, neither of us are being paid. So it's very efficient, uh, Elizabeth. And uh, this is just the start of it. I'm very excited to see what happens here and where we're going to suck out a lot of the, the wastage in government. And this could be, uh, you know, a, a, a shining light for the rest of, you know, the world to see how to run governments efficiently. What are your thoughts around how this can maybe trickle up into Canada and where we need someone like this or something like this to take over the next uh, you know, government in power? This is the fundamental difference between Canada and the United States from a governing perspective. And I, I don't care about your politics or your personal views of a Vivek or, or Elon and, and, and people's comments always get clouded because they hate somebody. It's like, Step back and say, you have two incredibly successful business folks that are willing to kind of come in and do something that no government has done since I was born. And what I love about the United States is the embrace of the private and public sector and the flip flopping of. You know, if you're, if you want to go to the treasury, you go on Wall Street, you learn your chops, you go into treasury, you, you provide value to the U.S. government, you then go back. I love this stuff. In Canada, it's dominated by bureaucrats. And there's this reluctance of, well, why would you ask the private sector for any help? Why would you even get their advice? And where you see this in particular and where this like, just smacked me in the face is in our international bilateral trade negotiations. And the first time I saw it was during the Trans-Pacific Partnership and looking at the various clauses. And you start to see, oh my God, this is Disney asking for this. This is Pfizer asking for this, et cetera. And yet we didn't realize that you have the firepower of all this talent and who really understood their businesses going up against us in Canada where you really have bureaucrats focused in on this. And it's, it's an unfair fight. What I would love to see is the embracing and the asking of Canadian governments to ask the private sector saying, it's your duty to help us. We need your help and come in. And I think you would get a long line of folks who just want to help, but just be asked uh, and asked to serve for your country. I can tell you this flat out. I've never heard anyone in my generation ever, ever talk about being in politics. Like it's just never come up in conversation because of how broken the system always has. This might actually change that. I think the fact that you have two, you know, one of the greatest influential person in our generation that's contributed to society, but probably bigger than anyone, uh, between uh, electric cars, so, uh, solar uh, panel, uh, you know, Starship, Neuralink, uh, you name it, uh, open AI. I mean, there's no m more person better to lead something like this than obviously Elon. But the level of transparency that they're also bringing to this is something we've never seen. So they're actually, uh, there is a Twitter account. It's the Department of Government Efficiency, Doge. It's got the great check mark, so it's a government uh, account. And they've already put out posts that says, we are grateful to the thousand Americans who express interest in helping us. We don't need more part-time ideas. We need high IQ, small government revolutionaries willing to work 80 hours per week. If this is you, send us your resume and we'll review the top 1% of applicants. I mean, this is truly something that is going to impact, I believe, whether you believe it or not, something that has never been done before. At a bare minimum, uh, anybody from government listening to this, as opposed to poo-pooing uh, what they're doing only because you may not like their politics, how about actually listening to some of the ideas because there's going to be a bunch of ideas that will equally apply to Canada. Matt, you just touched a great point. I am very involved with government policy and I'm a nonpartisan 
type of person. I, I am a policy wonk. I just want to help. But, but I d- have zero interest in politics. I have a lot of interest in trying to help the country. That's really the focus point. And I think a lot of people, particularly the younger people, would love to have purpose and would love to help. And, but the key thing is, let's not block them. Let's welc- them, welcome them in to help. And we got to change that narrative as well. And I bet you, you'll see a lot of young kids, they'll say, I just want to help. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the average age, I think I see of some of the uh, nominees are like mid to early, uh, late 40s. Um, <laughs> which is a, a great start to, to seeing how this cabinet shapes up. Well, we'll see how this plays out, John. But until next time, thanks for joining us in the tank today. Great. Thank you. Now, let's jump into the tank for this week's episode with John Richtigar from RBCX. Thanks for joining us in the tank today, John. Matt, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. You know, John, you and I have known each other for quite some time here. Obviously, we have gone back many years. But for some of our listeners who aren't so familiar with you, can you tell us a bit about your background and currently what your role at RBCX is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thanks for having me on, uh, John Richtigar. I, you know, I was an operator turned investor. So I spent a little bit of time um, at Shopify, specifically at Shopify Plus in Waterloo, helping them build out their new markets team. I then moved out to the United Kingdom, worked for a company called VaynerMedia, uh, based out of New York City, but specifically building out their Europe and Middle East arm, building out an e-commerce team and product after coming out of my Shopify experience. And then after that, I moved back into tech and was chief of staff at a growth stage Canadian technology company called Cognitive, both in the UK and Toronto. And so five years of operating, realized I wanted to take some of that and kind of come into the investor world. And so I've been with RBCX, leading RBCX Capital, really for the better half of the past three years. And everything I do now is about supporting Canada's venture capital ecosystem, investing in funds, directly investing in companies, and building products and data reports that are all designed to help build more value and data transparency to our product market in Canada. Yeah, when I describe you, John, I, I describe you as the data guy in venture capital. I mean, going from Shopify to Gary V all the way into the mind depths of uh, venture capital data uh, is a hell of a run, but it's very awesome for you to be such a uh, data mind in this ecosystem. What we're here to talk about today, though, John, is this very interesting piece that you just dropped called Spotlight on Capital Exited in Canadian Venture Over the Past Decade. So maybe tell the audience a little bit about what inspired you to focus your analysis on the capital exited rather than the more calmly discussed capital invested in the Canadian venture ecosystem. And maybe when you even thought about this idea. The the origin story for this uh, happened last Christmas. So it's essentially been a year in the running. And the reason why this all came about, even going back, was I was asked by one of our one of our GPs, one of our general partners, a fund that we invested in. They asked me, John, why do financially minded LPs invest in venture? When you think about how risky venture capital is perceived to be. And the answer I gave was very quite straightforward. It was the fact that venture capital is the highest performing asset class if you invest in the best companies and funds. Uh, and obviously, if is a huge part of that. But more specifically, the reason why LPs invest in venture capital is because it has such a high degree of return asymmetry. And what I mean by that is venture capital is the only asset class that you can invest in whereby you can get 100x return on your money while only ever being able to lose one times your cost. But what's really important to remember in this context of asymmetry is to actually uphold that. You really need uh, something we've spoken about a lot over the past few years as an ecosystem is this notion of capital efficiency and specifically equity capital efficiency. And I'll give you the example as an example, right? Like if you exit for $100 million and you only raise $10 million in equity, your capital efficiency would be 10x. What's important to understand is, from my perspective, though people can talk about capital efficiency at a company level, I think it exists at an industry level as well. Meaning, if we produce $30 billion of exit proceeds across Canadian venture, for us to achieve a 3x on our industry, that means we can only allocate up to $10 billion of equity capital. Or if we've already allocated $30 billion of of equity capital, we need to produce $90 billion in exit value to achieve that same 3x return. The issue that I was running into was I couldn't find any data set on capital allocated to Canadian venture over the past decade. Allocated meaning capital raised by general partners of Canadian funds by limited partners who are investing in those funds. And I also couldn't find a data set that actually looked at capital exit. So what my team did really over the course of the past year, our first report came out in June, and it was essentially a look back on the past decade of Canadian venture capital but capital is being allocated to the asset class. And so we're able to see, okay, how much money's actually gone in? And then this other report, which came out just yesterday, um, and kind of the blog post and publication was the first of its kind, which is looking now at capital exited over the course of the past decade. 
So when you bring this all together, I'm sure we'll get into it. But from my perspective, I think to understand the health of an ecosystem, most people, to your point, Matt, only ever focus on capital invested, capital invested by VCs to startups. But from my perspective, I think to really understand the collective health, you need to understand all three capital vectors being capital allocated, capital invested, and capital exited. And that was really the whole purpose of this report, to be able to shed more light on what's actually been the total capital that's been exited from Canadian Venture and how does that relate to the amount that we've actually put in. Right. And I think some of the ideas that you and I discussed was how people took over the headlines of billion dollar exits or billion dollar unicorn companies, but they forgot that there was a billion dollars invested in the company to start with. So you're kind of, you know, washing one hand against the other. And if you have a company, as you said, that invests, you know, raises $10 million, but exits for a hundred million, that's a great 10x on capital efficiency and the exit value. But if you have a company that raises a billion and exits for 1.2, not so much. So I guess you picked a really interesting decade <laughs> for this study to start and sort of wrap up. So can you kind of elaborate on what you found and obviously some of those spikes, uh, both up and down that you came across and how you kind of thought about the time, the snapshot in time and where you were pulling this data from and how that impacted some of the results? So that's a big question. Um, so I'll try to kind of compartmentalize what you said and answer it as eloquently as I can. I'll first say that the reason why this past decade is important is because it's the first time we've able to be actually to understand what the past decade of, uh, of data looks like when you think about Canada having intentionally built our ecosystem since the Venture Capital Action Plan launched in 2013. So that was when we really started intentionally building Canadian Venture. Now, when you look at where we are today, we're 10 to 12 years later. So we have a decade of data. So that's the first thing I'll say. The other really interesting thing to consider, though, is um, if you go back to the global financial crisis, it was the first time ever where the Bank of Canada took rates to near zero. And they essentially kept them there for the subsequent decade because they realized that inflation actually didn't spike past their 2% target. The way that I kind of described this past decade, which probably makes it really unique, is we were almost on a travelator. For those that don't know what a travelator is, it's one of those moving walkways in airports. And we were on them when, when we didn't even realize we were on it. That's how kind of smooth things were going, right? Like capital was readily available, capital was cheap, valuations were high, asset prices grew. And so to your point, it was for sure unique when you think about the average interest rate over this past decade being close to one to one and a half percent versus in the 80s, 90s and 2000s in Canada, it was closer to five to 11 percent. So take that with a grain of salt, because I think that had a huge, huge role to play from a macro perspective. Some of the interesting insights that we found from the data set. I think the first thing that was interesting to me that really stood out is one of the things we wanted to understand was how much exit value was generated in each successive year. And how was that exit value ultimately concentrated? 2020 and 2021, everyone speaks about those two being record years for liquidity in Canadian venture and huge anomaly years. 50% of the past decade's exit value in the Canadian venture ecosystem was generated in 2020 and 2021. That to me was remarkable. Maybe for some people it wasn't too crazy, but to think that two years of the past 10 were responsible for over 50% of the exit value generated made me kind of underscore the importance of market cycles and as an investor, understanding where you are in that market cycle and understanding as well that as an investor in 10-year e-liquid funds, you need to make sure that you're having consistent capital allocation so that when these market cycles do hit, you can take advantage of them. One piece that isn't necessarily in the report, Matt, is we obviously do a lot of comparison to the U.S. market. And what we found is 2020 and 2021, the data is identical in the U.S. It was also the two years of the past 10 where 50% of the aggregate exit value generated in U.S. venture was also generated. So the big takeaway for me, point one, is holy cow, do market cycles ever have a huge impact when it comes to just venture capital liquidity and the performance of our asset class? I mean, this is the famous quote that Bill Gurley mentioned, which is you can never time market cycles. You just got to enjoy it on the ride up as best you can and hopefully get off before it falls. A hundred percent. You're bang on. And I actually reference, you know, Bill Gurley, I read uh, uh, Above the Crowd, all this stuff. It, it's phenomenal. He kind of refers to the market cyclicality and venture to be not like a sign curve, but actually like a sawtooth wave. We have a gradual risk on investing period, a peak liquidity window at the top and a sharp and abrupt risk off decline. And if you look at any data set, whether it's the invested numbers, the allocated numbers, the exited numbers, it, it absolutely holds true. The other thing I say that really stood out was, you know, everyone talks about the power law in venture. It's probably like two of the most common words that everyone talks about. I was blown away as to how, how prevalent the power law is when you look at it from Canada's exit track record. One of the things our team did was we looked at all exits in Canadian venture over the course of the past decade that were over $10 million in size. So that's a little caveat. 
we don't look at the long tail, but the long tail from a value perspective is incredibly low. So it actually doesn't change the numbers gradually. You said $10 million Canadian or US? CAD. So to the, so in total over the past decade, we saw, we, co- we qualified 184 exits in Canadian venture that were at least $10 million and up. The reason why we chose that $10 million bound was because we needed to verify every single exit. What's interesting is of those 184 exits, the top 50 were responsible for 85% of the aggregate exit value. So to say this differently, those 184 companies over the course of the past decade generated roughly $56 billion in exit value. The top 50, 27% of the 184, generated $47 billion, which is over 84%, which is outstanding to me. Like, again, like the thing that I turned to when I, when I first saw that data was, holy cow, is it ever important to be able to get a top 50 size exit, exit outcome? based on how much value is concentrated in the top 50 and how much of a smaller long tail we have, which is potentially just a function of, again, our, our ecosystem only starting to be intentionally built from 2013 now through the rear today. Now, you said you had to validate every one of those exits, which is hard to do. I assume you had to go through some LP reports, maybe some public uh, reporting, things like that, but also accounting for cash and equity as well. All the data is public. Uh, we had to go through our own proprietary sources, conversations, pitch book, crunch base, CB insights, prequins. So we were able to get a very good view of everything. We understand, and I think I'll be the first one to say, the data is not necessarily perfect. Directionally, I'm very confident in it. But that's how we're able to get to the kind of holistic data set. It's unbelievable. I mean, listen, I told you, we started this in Christmas. It took us a year to get here. So though it looks kind of nice when it's there and it looks pretty slick, it was a huge grind. Um the other thing, just because you mentioned takeaways, Matt, I want to touch on uh, I want to touch on one more that stands out, and this the the notion of exit capital efficiency or cap efficiency. So we were at the Band Venture Forum. I had the privilege of keynoting the forum, and uh, one of the things I asked the audience, and it was I was actually blown away how well this worked. I asked them, okay, say you're all early stage investors, and say you had the ability to invest in one of two companies: Company A exited for 100 million, Company B exited for a billion. Which one would you rather invest in? Everyone, as you can imagine, said B a billion dollars. But then I said, okay, well, what if I told you that to get to that billion dollar exit, company B needed to raise $500 million in equity capital, whereas company A, the exit for 100, only needed to raise 10. Which one would you rather invest in? Literally almost every single hand flipped to company A. And the fact of the matter is, as an LP, you'd get a five times more profitable return having been an early stage investor in company A exiting for $100 million than company B exiting for a billion. The reason why that's important is because I think everyone, um, we look at the sticker price and we look at exit value. But one of the things I learned is not all exits are created equal. And there are significant follow-on implications and consequences that come with raising more and more cash. And one of the things we wanted to look at is instead of just looking at exit success, as it's typically looked at by the size of a given exit, we wanted to actually look at it to the opposite way, which is by its profitability. And profitability to their underlying shareholders, i.e. the founders, the early employees who have RSUs and equity, the GPs who invest in the companies, and ultimately the LPs who invest in those GPs. And so we came up with this metric was when we kind of, again, scoured the internet through all the different public proprietary data sources and proprietary data sources to understand how much of the top 50 largest VC-backed companies in Canada, what their primary equity stack was prior to exit. And so we were able to understand, okay, how much did they each raise? And then we were able to build a multiple based on what they exited for relative to what they ultimately raised in the private markets. So we can build an efficiency metric. And what's really interesting is if you look at exit success by efficiency, and you look at the top 10 exits in Canadian venture over the past decade, only four of the top 10 by exit size are also a part of the top 10 by exit efficiency, which to me... The biggest insight there is bigger is not necessarily always better, and a bigger bigger exit does not necessarily always lead to a more profitable exit. So as investors, as founders, as an ecosystem, I think the big takeaway that I had was we have to be absolutely striving to build, you know, billion-dollar-plus exit that can help grow our Canadian venture ecosystem, but we also have to be incredibly mindful as to how we're actually building these companies capital efficiently from an equity perspective. And what years did those exits happen in, though? predominantly the top 50. So the analysis that we ran on that cohort was the top 50, a good chunk of the top 50 largest of Canada's VC-backed exits over the past decade, as you can imagine, came in 2020 and 2021. You know what's crazy too, though, John, is that one, two, three, four of the top five are all biotech, except Verifin. So Abcella, 
uh, Chinook Therapeutics, uh, then Verifin, then Fusion, and then uh, what's the uh, pharmaceutical one, and then Shopify. So, and then therapeutics again behind it before carbon engineering. So you've got like such a huge skew to biotech as those biggest drivers and also on capital efficiency, I assume. Correct. Yeah. You know what? It's interesting. I didn't necessarily break out the data in this report on capital efficiency for life sciences versus kind of ICT. So I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but you know, there is part of the report that touches on life sciences in a sense that they were responsible for some of the largest exits in Canadian venture over the past decade. Right, exactly. Now, there's also something about the maturity of our ecosystem where this is sort of like a selection bias, right? Because our companies aren't able to always raise the most versus some of their US peers. So they've had to become capital efficient in their life cycle. But that has worked out in what you're saying is quite well for investors and GPs, wouldn't you say? I'd think so. I mean, you know, I would think that it's a balance, right? I think as as a Canadian and as a part of this ecosystem, I think the goal for us remains how do we build Canadian founded but globally capable technology companies, right? That's what I consistently think of. And I think, you know, we have by virtue probably had to be a little bit more efficient than our U.S. peers, Uh, maybe just function of reality and by actually not having as much capital sloshing around our ecosystem as there is in the U.S., And so that's forced Canada to build this capital efficient stereotype, which is actually a great stereotype because it's actually true. And when you look at the numbers from a capital efficiency perspective, we're going to come out with a piece of report later next year, which looks at the similar analysis, but for the U.S. market. And I'm really interested to see how does the median and interquartile ranges of efficiency numbers for what we put forward in Canada compared to the U.S. data set that we're coming out with. Yeah, I mean, the the one chart that always jumped out to me in this report was the efficiency one as a percentage of exit value to the capital efficient levels across the top 50 core. Obviously, on the highest end of worst efficiency, I guess, would be Element AI. It just jumps off the chart. But then on the lower uh, side of capital invested versus outcome, you've got some really interesting, you've got Thinkific, you've got Copperleaf, you've got uh, obviously all the therapeutics ones. There are some pharmaceutical ones that have a pretty uh, high capital investment versus exit. But overall, the bar sort of averages around, I don't know, like 20%, give or take. It looks like it, which is really good. I mean, that's, that's a really nice thing to see across all of the top 50 exits. Now, We are early, though, in this life cycle, John. So, you know, given how long it takes to even get exits, you talk about how the average exit was around, I think, eight years or so, or the median exit age is 12 years, and the first financing exit is eight years across Canada's top 50 exits. So venture is a very long game. What do you think that means for either younger GPs like myself just starting out uh, versus ones that have been in it for eight to 10 years and are still waiting for that power law? Ventures, one of the things, again, I haven't been in this business for that long, but one of the things I've learned very quickly when you understand how the money flows is venture is tough. Like venture is very difficult and may seem obvious to most, but I just realized how difficult it is and how long it is. And so candidly, one of the things that I think about when I looked at the data and, and some of the advice that I have, at least for GPs, really stood out when I looked at the distribution of exit ranges between Canada and the U.S., not necessarily the fact that there's a absolute delta between exit values, because I think we all kind of understand that generally, given there's larger exit values in the US and Canada. The thing that stood out to me is, okay, what are the implications for Canada having exit values in the ranges that they do? And from my perspective, those really two. The first is in Canada, we have to stay incredibly disciplined on entry price and incredibly sensitive on entry valuation. And the second is we really need to prioritize capital efficiency. And let me give you an example here, Matt, because I just find examples are the easiest way to kind of comprehend this. If you look at the median exit value over the course of the past decade in Canada, it was 93 million. And if you look at that median for the US, it was 141 million. Now, assume you bought 10% of a company by investing $2 million at a $20 million post money valuation. Assume no dilution till exit, but assume that company exits for either $93 million or $141 million. If it exits for Canada's $93 million exit value, what that'll generate is roughly uh, $9.3 million in proceeds and a 4.5x return. Versus for that US is 141 million, it'll generate 14 million proceeds and a 7x return. So obviously, keeping the structure of the deal the same, US with larger exit values, you generate a better return. But what if I then told you that Canadian investor, because they were very focused on entry price, and they were very disciplined on entry price, and they were very disciplined on being able to get in early, was instead of coming in at a $20 million post-money valuation, they were able to come in at a $12 million post-money valuation. 
you hold everything else the same, that $93 million exit would now actually generate $16 million in proceeds and an 8x return, which is stronger than the US's 7x return. That is the exact reason, from my perspective, why in Canada, given where exit values have been and relatively where they are to the US market, we need to be very conviction-driven early-stage investors as that can really be where the most alpha and upside is based on where exit values have landed. That's the first important piece. The second, the second piece... Uh, I'll mention is the importance of prioritizing capital efficiency. And the reason why this is important is, again, if you go back to those median exit values, Matt, essentially they're on median U.S. exit values have been two times as large as Canada. If you think about the 141 million being in USD and the 93 million being a cat, what that means is that means U.S. companies can theoretically ingest two times the amount of capital that we can while keeping capital efficiency equal. And the biggest reality for Canada is we can't simply copy the capitalization playbook as our U.S. peers. Because if we do that, what will happen? Well, we're going to essentially have the same level of primary equity capital or press stack in our businesses, but we're going to be exiting for values that are half the size. And what does that mean? Founders are going to be left with less. Employees will be left with less. GPs will be left with less. LPs will be left with less. And more importantly, the actual returns and recycled proceeds that come back to Canadian venture are going to be a lot less. So we, to your point earlier, need to be very focused on building capitally efficient companies, again, that are Canadian founded but globally capable. And as investors, from my perspective, really focus on being very ownership sensitive and getting in early with high conviction, which is, I know a lot of what you've preached at uh, at Ripple. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of like our strategy 101, but that's because of where we sit uh, as investors, the size of our funds, the size of our checks, and the kind of businesses that we invest in. You know, we try to say, hey, we're going to invest in Canada and try to get U.S. outcomes. Now, that's always not the way it works out, but that's what at least we try to. What would you say, though, to investors who are like, I'm not playing the game for capital efficiency. I'm playing the game for growth at all costs because that's what next downstream investors really care about. And at that level of sort of you know growth expectations, you need to have capital to put to work. If you're not double, tripling every year, like you're not really a venture scale business. That's what you hear all the time as a founder, as an early stage investor. What would you say to that based on the data you see? One of the things I think we learned in 2020 and 2021 uh, is growth can't be bought and not all growth is the same. And so I think when you're playing a growth at all costs mindset, again, this isn't novel at all, but you really rely on so many things out of your control, like the availability of capital, like the availability specifically of downstream capital. And if your business is only growing and you're realizing that you're bringing through a ton of cash, when the market reverts, as we've seen, it leaves many companies in what I previously called kind of the danger zone, but essentially in a very vulnerable position. One of the things I think about a lot about companies that are raising now is, I don't know what you're seeing, Matt, but I feel as though we're seeing on aggregate companies, especially those that are building in AI that are a lot more efficient than probably their peers at their stage over this past decade, raise a lot less and raise typically lighter rounds because they don't necessarily need that much capital. And so for growth stage investors, because growth stage investors have much larger funds and a lot of these funds have already been set, and they pretty much build deployment strategies on being able to allocate a certain amount of capital into certain companies to be able to get certain ownership targets because they need to generate strong fund level returns. My thinking here is, I think that early stage investors and early stage companies, especially those that are very capital efficient, are actually going to have a lot more leverage to be able to command really good liquidity scenarios for secondaries, as an example. And what I mean by that is, if you're a growth stage investor and you previously thought you'd be getting your allocations through predominantly primary equity capital, because these companies don't need all that money, the only way you're going to be able to get your 15, 20% ownership stake in that business is through primary and secondary. And so as an early stage company and as an early stage investor, I think over this next decade, we'll see the secondaries market probably pick up a little bit more than the prior, even in Canada. And I think what that'll mean is for early stage investors who, again, can get in early, will be able to see great opportunities come their way to generate liquidity, given the fact that these growth stage investors need to be able to find a way to hit their ownership targets, given how big their funds are. Yeah, I couldn't agree any more with you, John. And that goes back to Bill Gurley's uh, comments he made on his, his podcast about how venture over the last few years felt like the creation of Frogwa, where they were shoving money down the throats of these startups, even though they didn't really need them. And it was like $2 to spend on growth to generate a dollar of revenue. Uh, but you were showing that there was growth happening because, you know, you were starting from zero and whatever you could show from the growth perspective was warranted, even if it wasn't very capital efficient. But nowadays, what we're seeing at Ripple, the earliest stages is we're seeing companies that are building technology companies with two, three or four people way more efficiently and way faster in terms of their path to product market fit and revenue adoption, thing like that, than we saw only a few years ago. 
And so you're seeing companies that, you know, we are investing 500, a million dollars, get to a million dollars or so in revenue before they've even been burnt through that first initial capital. And they have a lot more paths to choose liquidity if they want it or to raise capital than just from the traditional seed or series A investors that look at certain metrics. They're kind of choosing their own destiny now because of all the things we're talking about, the lack of downstream investors the uh, efficiency of some of the technology and AI tools to build on top of now, and the ways in which they could eat away at margins that were potentially uh, not really uh, serviceable because technologies just cost so much to build originally, therefore you had to charge a lot more. So companies can charge a lot less for their products because it didn't cost as much to build them. It's just math. And so you're seeing companies realize that capital efficiency is a benefit to you and gives you a lot more optionality rather than just going through this growth at all costs mentality, right? 100%. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think you're bang on. So the interesting thing you also collected data on, which I thought uh, was really cool that you found, was between 2013 and 2023, you guys collected that Canada uh, VC funds raised $34.1 billion across 255 VC funds, where the US had raised $888 billion across almost 9,000 VC funds. And so even though they allocated a lot, a lot more capital, we kind of allocated at similar paces, right? And the ratio of U.S. capital uh, raised versus Canadian capital raised is almost identical, you know, in terms of how healthy our ecosystem was. I don't know if the, the data kind of tailed off. It looked like it did, obviously, uh, at the end of 22 into 23, which was a really bad year. But what does this data tell you in terms of the maturity or the maturing of our ecosystem? Yeah, pretty interesting data, I thought. Um, but you're right. Essentially, what we saw, obviously, the U.S. is a lot larger. They allocate much more capital than we do. Again, that's not a surprise. What was more so interesting is to see, to your point, Matt, the relative pace that we had versus the U.S. had over the course of the past decade was actually quite similar. I think the biggest takeaway, the reason why, you know, again, the whole, the whole point of this report was to focus on capital exited. And you just picked up on one of the very few pieces of the analysis that isn't about exit, but is actually about allocated. And the reason why we wanted to include that is for that last analysis that we actually did in the report, which is what we called the kind of cumulative exit value to capital fundraise ratio. And that's essentially where that came in. So I mentioned at the beginning, Matt, I personally think to understand the collective health of a given ecosystem, we can't just look at how much money has been invested. But more importantly, I think we need to look at how much money has been allocated to the asset class on a trailing basis and how much have we also exited on a trailing business to understand how efficient our, our ecosystem has been. So one of the kind of proprietary metrics that we looked at here was what I mentioned on that cumulative exit value to capital fundraise ratio. And we actually compared that to both Canada and the U.S. Now, what's interesting is on the U.S., essentially, without going through the specific numbers here, they were very efficient in 2013. So they would have exited 4.2 times the amount that they allocated in that year. And as over the course of the past decade, really up to 2021, as more capital was allocated because we went through this crazy macro bull market, you can see that number and that ratio go down because the ecosystem got a little bit less efficient as we saw much more capital allocated relative to exited. And then it peaked back up in 2021 because we had a crazy bull market. And that reverted back to 2.8x in 2023. So on a cumulative basis, when you look at the US market, they started in 2013 at a 4.2x exit value to capital allocated ratio. And then they ended at 2.8x. So otherwise saying over the past decade, they actually got, based on these numbers, a little bit less efficient. Versus in Canada, the story is actually quite different, right? In 2013, we actually would have exited 90 cents for every dollar that we allocated to Canadian Venture. Again, because that was when we just started first building out potentially our ecosystem. But over the course of 2013 to 2023, we followed a very similar trend to the U.S. market, but we're actually now at 1.6 in 2023, meaning over the past decade, based on our data, we have exited 1.6 times the amount of capital that we allocated to the Canadian ecosystem. So what does that mean? Well, on that decade, that means we've gotten more efficient. That's a really interesting way to look at how is Canadian venture doing as an ecosystem versus purely just looking at how much money have we put in each year and is money up and up money down. That's important. But the two takeaways from this chart, uh, which is the last one in the report that I think a lot about is there's still an absolute gap between Canada and the U.S. The U.S. is ending 2023 at a 2.8x efficiency matrix. Ours is at 1.6x. So you can't necessarily forget that there's an absolute gap that that exists and that needs to shrink. But what's going to be important over the next really five years and 10 years, and we will track this, is making sure that we're taking our 16 from 2023, and that's growing to 1.8 to 2 to 2.2 over time versus reverting back the other way. 
And that's how we can start to think about what's the smart way that we can allocate the right amount of capital to our venture capital asset class in Canada relative to ultimately what we've been able to produce as exit value over the past decade. Yeah, this by far is the most important chart, I think. Not to just you know credit all the other ones you put together, but this was the most impressive one because it definitely showed that there is progress. We are closing the gap and it seems like we are compounding on all the lessons and learnings we have where the U.S. is sort of taking this, you know, cottage-like industry and turning it into this institutionalized behemoth with so much capital, but the outcomes are not really matching that. And that's where sort of we're trying to find, we're learning basically from there may be mistakes. I guess one question I, I wanted to ask you, I couldn't figure it out in the report. How did you define a Canadian company? So essentially we looked at a Canadian company was one that was actually founded or headquartered in Canada. No matter who they were invested by, U.S. or Canadian investors? Correct. Yeah, there was there was a lot of cap. What we didn't go through is we didn't, again, this is potentially, I don't want to give too much away, but we could be coming out with this next year. Um, the underlying syndicates and the underlying investors in these companies and who was in the majority of them, who wasn't, how much capital was Canadian, how much wasn't. So the way that we defined these companies specifically is they were actually founded and headquartered in Canada. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think this trend is actually going to be even better because what we're seeing, given that we make so many investments in Canada, is that we are investing in Canadian companies incorporated in Canada, being built in Canada, but over 80% of their revenue and customer base is all U.S. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. Which I think is going to change a lot of the outcomes for a lot of these businesses, just like a lot of Canadian businesses take advantage you know, just being north of the, of the border. Given all of these things that you've learned from this report and how some of this data is way more valuable than some of the other things we see often in the media, how do you think this extends sort of to the mindset of what GPs and emerging managers like myself should take away from it as they kind of put down their heads and try to build the next Shopify out there? I think the thing for me that I, you know, again, Matt, I've only been doing this for a short while, but the, the thing that I realized very quickly was how opaque private markets are and specifically how opaque venture capital is. It becomes very difficult to learn about an asset class and to learn deeply about the asset class when there isn't a lot of uh, differentiated reports, insights, and data or just widely accessible reports, insights, and data. And so the first thing I want to say is the real reason why we wanted to put this out there was because I think there's a ton of value in being able to help democratize knowledge to this asset class Given how much I think venture capital will play in our Canadian economy over the course of the next 50 plus years. And so that was really the goal of being able to kind of help build something like this up. As it relates to investors, I think the thing that I'll say is really just about trying to help add different mental models and different tools for our Canadian investors and GPs to essentially hopefully try to benefit as to when they look at allocating, when they look at investing how they can use some of this thinking in their own kind of day-to-day and embed it in the way that they ultimately run their firms. That's the other way that I probably think about how folks can kind of leverage this type of data. It's so interesting because like those are the things I literally think about every day, every night, waking up uh, and going to sleep is like, how do you maximize these sort of frameworks of which we are sort of not confined to, but sort of operating within these like invisible rules of the game in ways that venture capital math works and ways in which our ecosystem is performing. Um, Because, you know, as you and I have talked about uh, in many of our conversations, like betting on businesses at sort of high entry prices, high US cost base, and hoping for a power law outcome doesn't really give you a lot of optionality. Like it's not the only way to really drive returns and success for your investors and for, you know, everyone involved, right? Totally agree. I mean, I went through that at the beginning of the podcast, but like, again, we're not, people aren't necessarily venture capital for a median exit values, but if you take a $93 million median exit value and you own 10% of that business on exit, that's $9 million in proceeds. If your fund is, I don't know, north of $100 million and you have to try to 3X that fund, you have to try to do that 30 times over or find 30 times the amount of exit aggregate enterprise value, which is very difficult to do. So I totally agree with you. I think being able to be mindful about as an investor, one of the things that I think about a lot, and it's a very kind of old saying, is the only thing you can control is entry price. Being very mindful and prudent about the things you can control, I think will only pay, pay huge tailwinds when, the, when you're looking back on this 10 years later. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for putting this report together, John. It's uh, everything we've thought about, but never really had the time or the data to actually articulate it as beautifully as you did. But before we wrap things up, we always ask our guests for their fast favorites. So first off, your favorite podcast. 
Favorite podcast would have to be um, 10X Capital by David Weisberg. Great podcast for allocators. We got to get you on there. Well, you know, maybe one day we'll get there. I'm, I'm working my way up. I got tank talks here, right? Maybe one day. Okay. This is the warm up. Exactly. Next is your favorite newsletter or blog. Big fan of the team at Altimeter, specifically Jam and Ball, specifically Clouded Judgment. A lot of really good stuff that he pumps out pretty much on a weekly basis and has been doing that for a long period of time. So love his work. Yeah, fantastic one. Next is your favorite tech gadget. Garmin watch. I'm a big long distance runner. Can't go anywhere without my Garmin. That's all I wear now. Like what's an average distance run for you on a weekend? Just casually. You know, between I'd probably say 10 and 20K is kind of what I would try to get done as a longer run. Just, yeah. All right. I'll be back in a bit. Just going for a quick 20K. Okay, got it. <laughs> to next is your favorite new trend. Uh, it's funny, you and I were joking about this before the podcast started. I'm just trying to cook a lot more. I think eating out has become way too uh, way too much a part of a long work life and, and a busy life. So I'm just trying to be a lot more prudent with what goes into my body and, and doing a lot more of the cooking at home. I find it so therapeutic, uh, especially with two young kids at home, like just to stand there and cook and make all this stuff. But also having all the, the food made, like meal prep on like a Sunday and put it all in the Tupperware. And just have a bunch of like, you know, like you walk into a nice salad bar and you have all these different options to pull from. Like, that's what I want my fridge to look like. You just pull out all those pre-made uh, grilled veggies and stuff. That's awesome that you're doing that. Next is your favorite book. The Score Takes Care of Itself, Bill Walsh. Really good leadership book uh, and principled book about uh, if you do the right things, then, you know, the right things will happen here and the score will take care of itself. Famous coach, uh, if our listeners don't know who that is. Big, yeah, yeah. Big football coach. Big NFL uh, for any 49ers fans out there. But uh, yeah, big NFL all-time football coach. Amazing. And last but not least, your favorite life lesson. Favorite life lesson would have to be, um, you know, don't worry about things outside of your control. There's so much outside of your control. If you just focus on what you can control, I think that'll just bring you a lot more happiness, probably. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us in Tank today with John Richtergaard, Director of Capital at RBCX. Thanks, man. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Tank Talks. We hope you found today's conversation as insightful as we did. If you're enjoying the show, we've got three quick things to ask of you. First, hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcast or YouTube. Next, follow us and stay up to date on upcoming episodes and behind the scenes content on social media with Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And lastly, share the love. If you found value in today's episode, share with a friend or colleague who'd benefit too. Your support helps us bring in more amazing guests and keeps the Tank Talks engine running. That's it for today. Until next time, keep disrupting and innovating.